Okay, thanks. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I apologize beforehand if my presentation seems a little bit rushed. I got married four days ago, and so I haven't had time to practice that much. Um, so <laughs> thanks. Um, OK, so this uh, a personalized BDM mechanism uh, for efficient market intervention experiments. This is joint work with my advisor, Johan Ugander. Um, all right, so imagine that you have, uh, you want to introduce a subsidized product or service to a new market. Uh, and you want to estimate the causal benefits for this product or service, and at the same time you want to estimate the demand for the product or service uh, in a given population. Uh, we'll concentrate on this talk on products and services that can be introduced to low income development settings. So we are also very interested in the experiment to be cost efficient. Um, we'll show that personalizations allows uh, more efficient experiments to be run uh, while preserving without sacrificing uh, causal interpretation. Uh, yeah. So uh, the motivation behind our work comes from this paper by Barry Fisher and Gutierrez. They used the BDM, a second price auction mechanism, to give water filters in northern Ghana to low income populations. Um, and so other, other settings in which these kind of like mechanisms can be used, in which you need to estimate the demand and causal effects, are for example in introducing new agricultural products as Kramer, Duplo, and Robinson, um, or in introducing new health products uh, in developing countries. Um, okay, so. There are like here are our, our, like our two objectives then are demand estimation and causal effect. So what do we do for each one of this? For demand estimation, we usually can uh, do some dynamic pricing. We can use some take it or leave it um, strategies, or we can go deeper and try to estimate uh, users' willingness to pay using a second price auction, for example, a recurry auction or a BD or, or the BDM mechanism. Um, we can for estimating causal effects, we can run an A/B test. Uh, we can do some offline policy evaluations, or again, we can do the BDM mechanism, which I'll explain now. Um, so what is the BDM mechanism? Uh, so the setting is as follows. We go to the field and we offer a product, uh, in this case, a water filter to a user, and we ask the user for their willingness to pay. Uh, this is the maximum amount they would be willing to pay for the product or the service. Uh, then we draw a price at random from a distribution, uh, and if the price is below the user's willingness to pay, we give the product and, cha and charge the second price. So this is a second price auction against a random bidder. Um, now, before I go on with why this mechanism can estimate demands and provide causal estimation, I'll give some refresher about what we mean by causality. Uh, so we mean by causality the neatman rubin causal model in which we assume that all units have uh, two potential outcomes. One whenever they are assigned to treatment, one when they are assigned to control, and we're interested in the difference between uh, these potential outcomes. Now, the problem with this is that this, is this difference cannot be observed. We can only observe one of these two quantities. And so we then es try to estimate the expectation of this difference. Uh, one of the, one, uh, a very typical estimator is the difference in means. Um, However, like when we assign people to treatment and control, we don't actually need for the treatment to be assigned with equal probability. If we have different probabilities of assignment, we can down weight, we can weight uh, our, our, our um, observations by the inverse of the probability uh, of, of treatment. This is called the thompson horowitz estimator. Um, and the thing with this estimator is that it's highly volatile, so we can further correct it by dividing over the sum of the weights, uh, which we call the, the, it's called the Hayek estimator. Um, but throughout this talk, I'll be concentrating on the non-weighted version of this estimator, which is a horowitz samson uh, because that is easier to analyze and like all, all of the results apply also to the Hayek estimator. Um, another strategy to do causal estimation is doing certification or block estimates. Uh, if in this case, we can divide the, the space of, of users depending on the probability of being treated in different bins. In each one of the bins, we compute the difference in means estimator, and then we post stratify it taking the weighted average. Uh, this is in general a more, a more robust estimator. The problem with this estimator is that usually at the very ends of the bins, you need to do some trimming. So in the end, the final population that you're interested in is not the one you're actually computing the estimates. So that's why we concentrate on the Hayek 
estimator. Um, so going back to the man estimation and causal effects, with the, with the VDM mechanism, we can elicit people's willingness to pay because it's an incentive compatible mechanism, assuming uh, that users are uh, utility maximizers, expected utility maximizers. Um, when estimating causal effects, we have two sources of randomness. We have that conditional unwillingness to pay, the treatment is random, and we have that conditional unwillingness to pay and, the, and being treated, the price that people pay is random. Uh, we'll concentrate on the first type of, um, of randomization, and we are actually currently working on the second one and, and the trade-off between one and the other. So what we do is we, um, we use personalization to reduce unnecessary co costs for the experiment. Uh, we use it to like reduce the variance of our estimators. And in the end, we show that it still maintains incentive compatibility uh, in this setting. So for personalized BDM mechanism, we refer to the same setting. We offer a product of cost C to a subject uh, with characteristics X. It's very important for the characteristics to be observable. Um, otherwise, people would be able to manipulate those characteristics in order to get different uh, prices. Uh, then we draw a price um, from, from a distribution, from a price distribution, without showing it to the subject. Uh, this distribution can be adapted to the characteristics of the user. And then we ask the user to report their willingness to pay, and the same thing happens. If the price is below the willingness to pay, we give the object, and the, the, the user pays the second price. Now, there are three alternatives. Uh, we analyze three different alternatives for, um, for the distribution of the prices. So the, most, the first approach that we tried and like the most straightforward is estimating the conditional, like the conditional expectation of the willingness to pay, conditional on the observed characteristics. Um, the problem with this mechanism is that it actually, once you've learned the distribution, like this model, it becomes deterministic. So there, you're not inputting any randomness into the model. Like people have a probability of being treated of either one or zero. So that there are ways of getting around that, but that's like, it, it is better not to go into that road. Um, we can run an RCT, a randomized control trial. Uh, we'll show also that there are some issues with a randomized control trial in terms of a budget. It's like the most expensive uh, thing that you can run in these kind of settings. Uh, and then what we will focus on is in a personalized uniform distribution which basically is taking a uniform distribution of prices and moving it uh, along the user's, our, our prediction of the user's willingness to pay, of the distribution of the user's willingness to pay. And we have these epsilon bounds at the beginning of, at, at zero and at the cost of the object in order for every user to have certain probability of being treated or controlled. Um, there are two special cases for this one. The BDM, the original BDM mechanism is when epsilon is equal to zero and the bounds are zero and, and C and the cost. And um, our, when we refer to PBDM, person, our version of personalized BDM, when the bounds A and B are uh, some quantiles, some percentiles of the, our, estimated, the, our estimated distribution of willingness to pay conditional on covariates. Um, so this is more or less how it looks like. The red, the red curve is our estimation of the willingness to pay, uh, condition on, on covariates. And so once we have that, we can estimate A and B, which are the percentiles, some percentiles depending on delta. And then we draw prices from the blue kind of distribution. We have the bounds at the very end so that everyone has positive probability of being treated and controlled but most of the draws come from the uniform distribution that surrounds the distribution of the willingness to pay. Now, the difference from BDM in our mechanism is that one can have different uh, characteristics, different observable characteristics, and so our uh, price distribution would adapt itself to where the distribution lies. Uh, so for example, in the, in the first case, the distribution of willingness to pay is like people, people with X1 have lower willingness to pay, so we will draw prices from the lower part of the distribution. In the second one, they have higher ones, so we draw prices from higher parts of the distribution. Now, uh, so we had three objectives. We wanted lower variance in our estimates. We wanted lower price, like lower like uh, costs, and we wanted to be incentive compatible. 
In terms of the estimator's variance, we have that expression, that is the estimator's variance, uh, assuming uh, under, under a Fisher's null, which means that there is no uh, treatment effect. Uh, this is minimized when the probability of being treated is equal to one half. So for the three uh, alternatives, the one that minimizes it is the randomized control trial. Um, the, one, the first one, which is just predicting, uh, estimating the conditional uh, willingness to pay, that actually has uh, variance equals to infinity. Um, and so if we draw prices from the personalized uniform distribution, we get something in between. And the important thing is that in expectation, uh, the expected variance, uh, we get that PBDM uh, has a lower expected variance than BDM. Uh, this is because if we take the expectation of the variance conditional on the, on the observed covariates, this expression gets minimized in approx like approximately um, when the median of the price distribution is equal to the expectation of the willingness to pay, the conditional expectation of the willingness to pay. Um, now, in terms of costs, we define this thing called budget regret, which is just simply whenever we treat someone, if we had known their willingness to pay beforehand, we would have given like a lower uh, subsidy. So if, if we know someone's willingness to pay, in order to treat men, the most efficient thing would be to give them a price that is just slightly smaller than their willingness to pay. However, since we don't know their willingness to pay, in practice we have some regret whenever we run this, uh, this experiment. And so we're interested in the expectation of that regret. And in that sense, the, the important thing about this thing is that personalization always is better than not personalization uh, for, for in terms of this uh, budget regret. Uh, the first and the last, the first and the last uh, mechanisms uh, have, like the RCTs actually maximize the, the budget regret and the first and last mechanisms show how personalization is always better than not personalization. Uh, finally, for incentive compatibility, uh, for the first and second, so for RCTs and predicting the conditional mean, uh, the, they are not incentive compatible strictly, so people are not incentivized to give their, their actual valuations. Um, for, the, for our personalized uniform distribution, we keep the incentive compatibility uh, with a probability higher than one minus delta. The only case where people would be indifferent between giving the true valuations or not giving the true valuations is whenever they know they are outliers in the distribution that the researchers have computed, which is a very, uh, it's a very w rare case and actually rebounded by, by one minus delta, by, by delta. Um, now, in order to test our experiments, uh, our algorithms, we actually run an experiment in Mechanical Turk. We, uh, we ask Mechanical Turkers to, um, to classify emails in spam or non-spam. And we actually allow them to bid on whether they would be timed or not. So we were trying to estimate the demand for time and constraints on Mechanical Turk and the effect on that on their work. Um, we asked some demographics from them. We, uh, we ran some tutorials and then we performed the PVDM mechanism. Um, and here for learning, for estimating the, the distribution of willingness to pay conditional on, on excess, we ran Bayesian regression and we used Stan as a package to, to do those, uh, to estimate that distribution. From that distribution we took the 95 percentile of the distribution and that's how we, we uh, delimited our uniform distribution from where we were drawing the prices. Um, this is what people saw. For example, in this case, the offer of the AI was 40 and the person offered 20, so they would have to be timed. Um, this is how the email looks. They had four seconds to say if this was a spam or non-spam, uh, which was a very complicated uh, task. Um, and so in the end, what we got was that PBDM had a higher percentage of treated people, which is what we expected. Um, the, the both ATEs measures are actually quite, like they, they are basically the same statistically. Uh, the, the, however, the standard error for PBDM is one fourth of the one for BDM. Um, and the average budget regret is 
considerably two thirds of what the BDM uh, budget regret was. Uh, not only that, but also for every, so this we did with Bootstrap, for every budget level, we had that the, BDM, the PBDM uh, Hayek estimator had lower standard error than the BDM um, Hayek standard error. Uh, and the reason for that is that PBDM actually does some probability smoothing in that people that have low willingness to pay, which means that they have low probability of getting treated, actually get a boost in their probability of getting treated. And people that have like very high probability of getting treated, that's the ones at the very, very end, get a lower probability of getting treated. So we have some examples in that, in that, side, of the, in that side of the distribution. Um, so to summarize, we presented a way to introduce personalization using machine learning to experiment, to experiment without losing the causal interpretation. Uh, we've shown that personalization can reduce the cost, the unnecessary costs of experiments, uh, the, the necessary subsidies in these kind of experiments. And we've evaluated our, me our methods in Mechanical Turk and found that even for a small sample size and the fact that we couldn't actually get a lot of signal from the covariates, even then our mechanism performed better than the classical mechanism. Um, we are currently working on the second type of randomization, which is how conditional unwillingness to pay and being treated, uh, the, the prices are assigned at, at random. And we are also looking for other applications that where we can actually predict willingness to pay so that we can show the true richness of, of these methods. Um, so that's it. So actually, yeah, so actually this is like, so the algorithm wasn't learning that much and part of it was the sample size, part of it was that the covariate that we were able to ask people from Mechanical Turk weren't that predictive. Uh, we tried other things and in general willingness to pay in that setting was very, like, not very good. There are other papers in other settings where actually predicting willingness to pay is, is, very, is very simple, uh, especially in development settings. Um, so yeah, probably another application would actually be better suited. Um, the important message here is that even, our, even though our application didn't have a lot of signal, we actually did improve on the, on, on the, on the baseline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something that if you go to the field, you wouldn't be able to know where exactly the thing is located. 